Okay, everybody, it's time we have to do discourse, okay? My lovely, lovely imps. Twitter is a horrible place, but occasionally, Twitter, or actually I should say frequently, Twitter acts as the spark that ignites a larger conversation. Unfortunately, usually for the worst. Uh, and recently, a very, very popular content creator who is trans uh, uh, named Philosophy Tube, aka uh, Abigail Thorne, uh, made a post on Twitter that has gone viral. And it has gone viral uh, in the negative way. A lot of people have been very, very angry about what Philosophy Tube said. And it has, of course, spiraled out into a larger conversation. Uh, we usually call this discourse. Sometimes we might even refer to it as a Twitter cancellation. Um, it's gotten pretty intense and it's gotten pretty toxic. Uh, and I want to talk about it. Uh, I uh, do my absolute best to um, engage as minimally as possible on Twitter. Uh, and I especially avoid engaging in any sort of discourse on Twitter itself. Uh, Twitter is where discourse truly goes to die. It is the worst place to try and have a serious conversation about anything. Um, but uh, instead, I like to sometimes take these topics and talk about them here on my stream. Uh, which you should press subscribe and ring the bell and press like on because it's awesome. And Demon Mama is an amazing streamer. Which that's me, by the way. I'm Demon Mama, in case you didn't know. And you would love watching my stuff, so you should press subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Cool, huh? All right, let's talk about this. Let's get right into it. So let me just show you what we're going to be talking about here uh, today. Uh, where, did, where, did my, where did my links go? Oh, where did my links go? Here we go. And I think you're going to understand pretty quickly why this, uh, this particular post got a lot of attention. All right, here we go. This is Abigail Thorne, Philosophy Tube. And note, Philosophy Tube is responding to an article. We're going to actually go read that article and we're going to see what it has to say. Or at least we're going to read some of it. Abigail says, this is probably because gender dysphoria was made up based on unreliable data by a bunch of cis doctors, multiple of, of whom have since been disgraced. We shouldn't need some cis person's fantasy diagnosis to transition. The fact that we want to transition alone is enough. Yeah, look at the view count on that. 572.9 thousand views, 321 retweets, 377 quote retweets, almost 5,000 likes. That's what we call a little bit of a viral moment, okay? And uh, I don't actually know. I mean, I understand to a certain degree why people are frustrated at this, because if you are very, very uncharitable, um, you could read this as basically saying that gender dysphoria is fake. And of course, that's going to bother some people because a lot of people experience uh, uh, gender dysphoria or something akin to it, and, and it hurts. Now, I am a trans person, and I have often described the pain uh, that I experience uh, as gender dysphoria many times. In fact, I think that the term gender dysphoria in and of itself isn't necessarily the worst term. Uh, however, um, I have a feeling here that there is some missing context that a lot of these people um, might be reacting negatively to. I mean, real quick, just to show you that people reacted negatively to this. Girl, what are you talking about? People are definitely feeling dy d dysphoric. Surely you're not saying that gender dysphoria isn't real, or do you think those feelings are real but named something else? What? Some years ago, I wrote a poem in, tri in which I tried to recapture my past dysphoria. When I recently reprinted it, a, a friend with psoriasis said he identified with it. I was worried I had offended him, but I realized no one pathologized his resentment of his condition. So this is actually a not angry response. This is actually a pretty reasonable one. 
Um, but there's a bunch of people here. You can see some of the top ones. Oh, you could have done a better job articulating this. As much as I respect people who don't have dysphoria, I do. And before and after transitioning every day is still a struggle. There's a lot of people sort of reacting to this off the cuff. Oh, and of course, the usual suspects got engaged. People who are bad faith and don't actually have a horse in the race, uh, of course, are going to participate in a uh, in a the opportunity for a dog pile. So let's look at what the original article actually said. Here's what the tweet said. When it comes to gender dysphoria, there has been little constructive dialogue, writes Kamran Abbasi in this week's Editor's Choice. Can a better appreciation of the evidence, as well as the limits of medicine, improve debate and practice in this area? Let's look at the actual article. The debate on gender dysphoria perfectly encaptures all that is unsavory about the intersection of science, medicine, and social media. Entrenched, even aggressively argued views are nothing new in science and medicine, but when it comes to gender dysphoria, just as with COVID-19, there is little room for constructive dialogue. Unfortunately, what suffers is people's welfare. The priority for health professionals must be to offer the best possible care to their patients. Difficulties arise when the evidence base is primary or inconclusive. In that situation, when faced with a person seeking care, what is the best care to offer uh dilemma is more acute if the person seeking care is a child or adolescent as you can see this keeps going the principle of care to re care remains the same ensure that the strength of your management recommendations is in line with the strength of the evidence but the weaker or the more disputed the evidence base the harder it is to offer a clear way forward uh let's keep going a review of the Gender Ide uh, Development Identity Service at the Tavistock Clinic by, Clinic by Hillary Class reported interim findings last year acknowledging difficulties that clinicians face when providing care. Uh, the U.S. has moved in the opposite direction. Uh, an investigation by the BMJ finds more and more young people are being offered medical and surgical intervention for gender transition while citation needed, sometimes bypassing any psychological support, citation needed. Uh... Much of this clinical practice is supported by guidance from medical societies and associations, but closer inspection of that guidance finds that the, cl the strength of clinical recommendations is not in line with strength of the evidence. Risk of overtreatment of gender dysphoria is real. Hmm. Hmm. Article's getting a little more strange, isn't it? If we have the best interests of young people at heart, then surely it's our duty to offer evidence-informed care. And if the evidence base is weak, we must provide the necessary support to young people as well as prioritizing research to answer questions that are causing a great deal of distress, much of which is amplified by social media. Hmm. Taking this route is essential. An evidence of void not only exposes people to overtreatment, but can also be used to deny people the care that they seek, such as through draconian laws now being reintroduced in some U.S. states. A better appreciation of the evidence, as well as the limits of medicine, is also the basis of a more constructive dialogue. So there's some interesting things going on in this article. Now, of course, there's a lot more to this. Um, actually, that's about it. That appears to be the end of the article. That's all that there is to it which is basically just saying, we need to open a dialogue. However, it also references some questionable claims and some hot topic issues that we already know get discussed all the time, such as this fear of over-prescription or over-diagnosis, which is suspicious at best. So now, we, now, now that we've read that article, does it make sense what Abby is saying here? Abigail Thorne is saying, well, Probably the reason the conversation is so fraught is because gender dysphoria was made up based on unreliable data in the first place by a bunch of cis doctors, multiple of whom have since been disgraced. We shouldn't need a cis person's fantasy diagnosis to transition. The fact that we want to is enough. Oh, it kind of changed the context there a little bit, doesn't it? Now that we know that the article is centered on uh, is sort of fixating on whether there is overdiagnosis uh and that the ev that the lack of evidence is a problem it now starts to make sense what philosophy tube was actually trying to say which is that well of course you're going to have issues sorting out the evidence if the people who defined it in the first place did so on problematic terms 
Now, of course, this has spiraled into a broader conversation. This has spiraled into a conversation about DIY HRT. This has spiraled into a conversation about whether or not gender dysphoria in and of itself is a discrete and existing phenomenon. The article is pro-medical gatekeeping, basically. It does appear to be. The article that we just read, um, uh, it seems to find it somewhat shocking that, uh, that, that young people, which it doesn't define very clearly, are able to gain access to, to gender-related care without psychological oversight. But, no, but keep in mind that psychological oversight is a pretty high bar. Real quick, out of curiosity, I just want to ask the audience real quick. Um, I, I just want to I want to ask the audience real quick. Does anybody know, even in a ballpark, what type of uh, what type of medical intervention is required for a cis woman whose estrogen levels are low? Just so, go ahead and sit on that for a second. I'm going to read a comment. Jackie Chan, but, but gay, says, uh, this is why I love Demon Mama streams, because she also explains underlying context, which helps me make more sense of the situation. You're very welcome. I'm devoted to combating context collapse, and I always bring the receipts. Biceps and Bikinis says, a GP visit and a blood panel. A, a, some people are saying a casual consultation. Yeah, no joke. If you are a cis woman, uh, and in fact, there are literally millions of cis women in America whose estrogen levels drop after menopause or for various other reasons, um, and all they have to do is talk to their general practitioner. They talk to their general practitioner, and their general practitioner takes a quick blood test, and there you go. They don't have to see a psychologist. They don't have to see a psychiatrist. They don't even have to see a therapist. But notice that this article is saying, is indicating concern about people not seeing a psychologist, psychological, not therapist, not, not doctor consultation. They are concerned that there aren't enough trans people talking to psychologists before they get their HRT. And doesn't that seem a bit odd? Doesn't it seem a bit weird that when trans people want the same medica medication that a cis person can get easily, they should have to talk to a psychologist? Well, let me talk to you about another related thing. How many people in, in chat know what the general requirements are um, for getting a, uh, a, a gender-confirming surgery? And this could be... Um, this could be a uh, facial feminization surgery. This could be an orchiectomy or orchidectomy, depending on which country you're in, depending on the terminology depends. Anybody know? S Octavia is close. Octavia says two doctor levels or two doctor's letters. Um, unfortunately, I have some bad news for you. Uh, in most places in the United States and, and the UK, uh, Two psychological evaluations are required with a letter from those uh, uh, from those psychs saying that you are indeed genuinely uh, gender dysphoric. Now, does anybody know what uh, uh, what you would have to get to if you were a cis person and needed reconstructive surgery for your face? Anybody know? You think you'd have to go to a psychologist? and get a psychological examination and a letter uh, affirming that you are genuine? Do you think that would have to be the case? Recently, I went with one of my partners. Uh, my partner has been openly and outwardly trans for over 10 years, okay? My partner wants to get an orchiectomy. For those who don't know, an orchiectomy is when your, your uh, testicles are surgically removed. Um, it's a, actually a quite low invasive surgery. Obviously it is irreversible, but that is true about many surgeries. It's a, a low risk surgery. Um, the doctor, the surgeon who we talked to actually apologized to my partner. I was in the appointment with that. The doctor apologized to my partner because 
he had to say, I'm sorry, but we need to ask you to get two psych evaluations before we're able to actually do this because of the pol because of the policies. He literally apologized. He said, we do not have to do this for anyone else. Obviously, we do orchiectomies all the time for people, but because you're trans, we have to ask this. And now, I also have had an orchiectomy. I had an orchiectomy years ago. Now, I didn't have any apologies from the doctors, which tells you a little bit of, about, you know, hey, some people are making, some areas are making progress. But be, 10 years being on hormones, 10 years being publicly and openly trans isn't enough. You need to get two psychological evaluations. Now, I want to point out something else. Um, psychologists are specialist doctors, okay? Um, even low-level cheap insurance generally insures general practitioner visits. Even low-level cheap insurance... Um, covers blood panels, basic blood panels, including hormones. Additionally, e if you don't have insurance, a general practitioner visit and a blood panel is significantly cheaper than a psychological evaluation, let alone two psychological evaluations. Um, specialists in the United States and other countries are very expensive. They are uh, less common. They often have long waiting periods. So I want you to, to recognize the unique burden that is being placed on top of trans people. A little bit wild, huh? A little bit crazy that because doctors have decided that our type of dysphoria, our type of unhappiness with our body is uniquely special and scary, that, uh, all, that trans people can't just talk to their doctor they have to get a psychological eval, which costs more money, is often takes a take can often take longer, and sometimes isn't even available. Um, it's a good question, little morphine Annie. Jackie Chan, but gay says my psychiatrist used to charge my union insurance two hundred and fifty dollars for a monthly vi visit. Imagine dropping that so that you could get a referral. Mm-hmm. So when Abigail Thorne is talking about probably because gender dysphoria was made up based on unreliable data by a bunch of cis doctors, multiple of whom have since been disgraced, we shouldn't need some cis person's fantasy diagnosis to transition. The fact that we do, that we want to, isn't enough. Abigail is not talking about whether or not a phenomenon uh, such as, you know, suffering pain based on gender is a real or fake thing. That is not what Abigail is talking about. Abigail is talking about how gender dysphoria as a unique diagnosis is weaponized to stigmatize trans people and make it harder for trans people to get the medically necessary care that they need. Now, keep in mind, all of this exists in a context in which we have medical fact that trans people who, who are not able to get the treatments that they need suffer and are, are targeted, are more likely to be targeted by hate crimes, are more likely to suffer from depression, are more likely to, to die from suicide, are more likely to die uh, from hate crimes. Those the trans people who are not able to get the care that they need are at higher risk in a multitude of ways. We have an, an abundance of evidence showing this, that nonetheless... Trans people are still required to seek out unique diagnoses that are specifically carved out for them. Now, if you think that I'm talking out, like I'm talking incorrectly here, let me give you a real quick thought experiment. And I want you all uh, to think about this real quick. Imagine a cis woman, okay? This cis woman goes through... Uh, um, a hormonal, maybe, maybe there's a pregnancy involved. Maybe there is a, uh, a life event or some other complication from a medical condition that leads this cis woman, uh, to have reduced estrogen levels and increased testosterone levels. And this leads to this cis woman, um, having darkened facial hair 
And this cis woman looks in the mirror and says, oh my God, I feel very, I do not like my appearance. I can see my facial hair. It's disturbing me. I do not like this. I would like to get this solved. This is, for all intents and purposes, identical to the gender dysphoria that a trans person would experience just on a smaller level. And that cis woman that we just imagined in our minds, who's having a little bit of darkening of facial hair, um, would be able to just walk into her general practitioner, say, hey, can you check my hormone levels? I think my hormone levels might be off and I'm having a darkening of facial hair and that is messing with me and I don't like it. It makes me feel bad and I'm starting to feel depressed about my appearance and I don't like it. And that general practitioner will say, no problem. Here's a prescription for a blood test. When the results get back, we'll get you a prescription for estradiol and maybe a testosterone blocker. No psychological oversight because these are low risk drugs. No need for specialists. No need for an endocrinologist. A general practitioner can do that. And you might note, well then why can't a trans person get that sort of care? Why can't a trans person who says the hormones that I have are causing me distress, please help me adjust them to, a, to, to allow my body to develop in a way that is comfortable for me. Why can't a trans person get that? The obvious answer is prejudice. The obvious answer is discrimination. And notice that this ties into the conversation around DIY. Um, as laws tighten all over, uh, all over uh, both the United States and the UK, as laws tighten around HRT, there has been a bunch of fear mongering uh, people saying trans people need to see an endocrinologist. Trans people need to see a psychologist or else they are being dangerous. And I'm going to just be completely blunt, okay? Um, I find this type of, uh, this type of approach to be, uh, if I'm going to be completely blunt, it's, it's biomedical fascism. It is the idea, un unironically, I mean it, it is the idea that because you belong to a, uh, a stigmatized class, you need to have uniquely different care that is also harder to access, that is also more expensive, that, uh, that is also sometimes completely inaccessible to you uh, before you can get the treatment that anybody else would have access to. I don't know how else you slice that than be calling that biomedical fascism. Endocrinologists deal with complicated hormonal issues. They deal with thyroid conditions. They deal with severe uh, hormonal dysregulation. They deal with um, with uh, lymphatic issues. They deal with severe fertility issues. That's what endocrinologists are specialized in. And to insist that all trans people need to have an endocrinologist, every trans person. Now it is true, some trans people might need an endocrinologist. If it turns out that your body uh, has other, other hormonal dysregulation, if it turns out that your body is resistant to certain types of hormones, if you have a allergic reaction to certain types of hormonal treatments, you might need an endocrinologist. But an endocrinologist is a specialist. And what you, what, but, but for the, and for the most person, for the average person, all you need is somebody who can take a blood test and tell you what your levels are and then to prescribe you a very safe medication that is prescribed to millions of cis people all the time. So this whole conversation around and, and honestly, this dog pile on Abigail is first of all, blatantly in bad faith. And secondly, asserts a worldview that is anti bodily autonomy and relegates trans people to a prejudiced position, a, a, a marginalized position in the medical world. And all of this is before we even get into critiques of ge uh, general critiques of medical and psychological gatekeeping. It's frankly disturbing to me how many trans people and alleged trans allies 
are completely willing to accept a blatant form of bodily of bodily fascism a a way of politicking somebody's body in a way that is blatantly discriminatory and blatantly asserts one class of people above another class of people uh, so easily. It frustrates me that so many trans people and so many allies are willing to accept this. Endocrinolo endocrinologists deal with diabetes mostly and fertility uh, and uh, thyroid issues. It's not just diabetes, but yes. I'm going to tell you a story from my own life real quick. Um, I'm going to tell you this is, so I, I grew up in a very rural area and uh, when I was first fo uh, forcibly outed to most of my family, I had to return to this very rural area because I had uh, nowhere else to go. And one member of my family completely, uh, who I was reliant on, completely uh, devastated my ability to continue going to college. I was completely and utterly restricted. My phone was, uh, was disconnected. My cards were disconnected. I was financially cut out of my independence. Um, and I had to return back to this place. Uh, when I got back, uh, my parents pressured me to go to a Christian therapist who encouraged me to wait until I was 30 to transition because I, because in his mind, I was experiencing, uh, sexual and spiritual confusion that would often clear throughout your twenties. Um, by the way, for the record, I am currently 32. So, uh, despite the fact that I have been on hormones for, uh, a very long time, uh, almost, I think over a decade now, um, this person would have had me wait until just two years ago to get on hormones. Uh, now, of course, I was lucky enough to convince, to stop going to the Christian therapist and instead find a legitimate therapist uh, and I talked to that therapist and that therapist after a few months was willing to write me a recommendation to go to the only person in the state who was willing to prescribe HRT to trans people. That person was a endocrinologist over two and a half hours from where I lived. A specialist uh, who, uh, thankfully for me, was not out of network but for many people would have been out of network because he was a part of a private hospital. So, so now I consider myself relatively lucky by all things considered. I'm sure many people would say that I am not very lucky for having to go through that, but I know that there are a lot of people who are in significantly worse conditions. There are people who lived in the northern part of my state who would have been four or even five hours away from that specialist. But at that time in history, that specialist was the only doctor willing to prescribe HRT at all. Every other doctor in the state would tell you to go to that doctor because they were not comfortable prescribing hormones for trans people. Now, there's no extra special knowledge that is required. Do you want to know what that endocrinologist did? That endocrinologist ordered a blood test and then gave me hormones. That's it. Blood tests and hormones. That's it. Nothing special. That's all that endocrinologist did. But every single time I needed a blood test because of the way the system was set up, I had to drive two and a half hours there, two and a half hours back. And I was lucky because I had a form of coverage through my work that covered that. A lot of people did not. Now, there is no explicit policy in most places in place that says that trans people have to go to an endocrinologist. But because of stigma, GPs are convinced that they don't, they either don't want to take the risk or they feel that they don't know everything that they need to know about trans people's health care. However, it is now in most places, in places like where I live now, the common way that you will receive hormones is um, uh, you talk to a GP. That GP, uh, if that GP is a, uh, a general practitioner, a, you know, whether it's a... Um, a uh, like what, what's it called? An, uh, an RN? No, not an RN. 
I did this last time. I always get the, the, the letters mixed up. Regardless, you go to your GP, a doctor, and your doctor, if they are a, uh, if they are a um, informed consent doctor, which many are, they will simply have you sign a form that says, I know uh, I've, we've discussed the risks and they will discuss the risks of HRT with you. Then they will draw your blood. Then they will give you a prescription based on the, on the standards of care, which are well published. And all that it took was education. That's all that it requires is teaching doctors how to access the already existing information. There is already medical consensus. There are already uh, guides for that, that exist that doctors can access. These things are published in medical software. Doctors uh, these days have access to medical databases that give them uh, standards of care, that give them access to uh, 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 to all kinds of, I mean, the information is wild. If you've ever seen doctor software, you type in a, a symptom and it can give you uh, standards of care, alternative standards of care options, uh, various medications that are used all digitally. And there's like multiple of these databases that are competing with each other because they're private companies. There's of course the WPATH standards of care. But notice that in the midst of all of this, the the unique diagnosis of gender dysphoria, uh, which in and of itself is not a, a bad term, it's a term that can be used to explain an experience, but it is a also often used as a it is also often weaponized as a as a a highly strict diagnosis to restrict care based on completely political grounds, on grounds that are not objective. They are political. Too Clever by Half says, this is how the Christians get us, making it impossible to get, get care that goes against their book. Doctors still often underdose I, estradiol, though, so remember to double check and DIY if you must. Actually, usually, I'll be completely honest with you. If you have a doctor and you suspect that they're underdiagnosing, um, just have them double check. They will type it into their computer and they will see the care, the standards of care. And if you're ever having an issue, here's a here's a here's a hack. Okay, this is a hack from from our allies in the disability community. Okay, learn to be a self advocate. Did you know that you are allowed to print off scientific studies and hand them to your doctor, and that your doctor is purportedly qualified to read those scientific and medical studies and tell you and say, ah, you're correct. I have literally had to do that in the past. I have been on hormones for a long time. I've had three separate endocrinologists. I've had a number of, I don't even, I couldn't even tell you off, off the cuff of psychologists and therapists. I have had a number of primary care doctors. I have run the gamut, okay? And I have had a doctor that didn't know what spironolactone was used for. That's an anti-androgen that's used to fight testosterone. It is the primarily used anti-androgen in the United States. They didn't know what it was used for, and they were worried. They were worried to prescribe me a drug that I'd been taking for five years because they said because they said this seems like it might be off-label, and I had to print off and hand them medical research, which they then read and said, "Wow, okay, you're right." I'm not kidding you. Learn to be a self-advocate, okay? Doctors are qualified to read medical research. You can also hand them medical research, okay? Anyway. Medicine is not a, just like any field, it is not a field of, of, uh, of all flowers and roses. Everything is not clean and always correct. There are doctors who are bad at their job. There are doctors who are bad people. There are also doctors that are good people, and there are also doctors that are good at your job. But if you happen to get a doctor that is not good at their job, if you have a doctor that is undereducated or a doctor that is neglectful, you have to know how to self-advocate, advoc okay? Um, and also, the, 
has nobody ever heard the term get a second opinion that it is a it is one of the most ancient uh of of uh of modern medicine sayings when in doubt get a second opinion you can go and check another doctor okay just recognize that medicine and representatives of the field of medicine are not without fault and in fact some of them are horrible there are severely prejudiced doctors there are doctors who are discriminatory there are doctors who do not like trans people i know this might come as a shock to some of the more uh, liberal members of the audience who believe that just because someone says they're a good person and has a credential on their wall that they are always going to be a good person and live up to that credential but the reality is there are bad people there were nazi doctors in world war ii how do you think they felt about Jewish people that were under their care? Hmm? This is not to say uh, uh, that, uh, that every opinion that every patient has is always going to be correct, but it's your body. You have to live in it. You have a say in what happens to your body. And if you believe that your doctor is mistaken, you have a right to challenge that. You have a right to interrogate that. Doctors are not uh, infallible gods that can be unquestioned. And also, neither are medical standards. Gender dysphoria as a phenomenon uh, is a way of describing the pain that some trans people feel around their bodies. But gender dysphoria as a phenomenon can also explain what some cis people feel about their bodies. It is not exclusive or unique to trans people. Cis people feel gender dysphoria all the time. Trans people, a lot of trans people just tend to feel a lot of it. And guess what? Even if you don't call it gender dysphoria. Even if you don't meet the diagnostic criteria for d gender dysphoria, you still deserve to have bodily autonomy. You still deserve to have access to treatment. Do you, do you, do those out there who are mad at Abigail, do they think that like, if you don't agree with the language of what's being described about you, that you shouldn't have access to medical care, that you shouldn't have access to medicine to help you survive? I've talked about this with regard to mental health. Some of you will recall me having talked about in the past how mental mental disorders are highly nebulous, okay? Most mental diagnoses, uh, everything from depression to anxiety, even to all kinds of schizophrenia diagnoses, these things are nebulous. And the reason for that is because not every case is 100% the same. These are not supposed to be locked in stone. Even among the medical professions, they are not supposed to be interpreted as, as you have X thing. This is the name that we have given a certain collection of symptoms. And these things are supposed to be, to some degree, flexible. Otherwise, it stops functioning. Um, and this is also true for things like gender dysphoria. Uh, these things are not, they don't have a single one diagnostic criteria. However, you'll notice that medicalizing institutions will often formulate harsh lines of diagnostic criteria. And I don't think that that's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing um, that uh, people are being blocked from care that they need and care that they are making an informed decision to pursue simply because of a technicality or a, a biased doctor or an undereducated doctor or explicit medical prejudice. And something else that I should say is that I don't appreciate fear mongering. I talked about this recently in a segment about DIY HRT. But fear-mongering, if you'll notice, is the core of the agenda that is aligned against us at the moment. Uh, there is the, the, the fear-mongering around trans people uh, has varying degrees, but fear-mongering is no help. Uh, being dishonest about the evidence is no help. Being uh, overstating the risks is not helpful. And also... What's even worse, and this is where this is what really gets me. This is what really makes makes some enemies. Okay, 
uh, is people who argue that we should not make information or medicine available uh, on the basis of of uh, of, of fear mongering. Uh, there are people who will overstate the risk of HRT. There are, of course, risks to HRT, but uh, all types of medicine have risks. Every single treatment from a back massage to alleviate uh, pain to over-the-counter pain medication to cold medication to heavy painkillers and psychological pills, all of them have risks. And it's important that we take those risks and meet them honestly. And also... Uh, I want people to acknowledge that we have multiple states in the United States and uh, a government in the UK that is advancing anti-scientific, discriminatory, politically motivated bans and restrictions on life-saving medicine. They are trying to make it harder and harder for people to get the medicine that they want and need. And I believe that the only ethical position if you are somebody who actually cares about the well-being of other people, the only ethical position is to take a harm reduction route in which you uh, conclude that the best thing that we can do is propagate safe standards of care that are publicly available so that everyone can research what, uh, what care is available to them. Uh, so that they can cross-reference with their doctors if they have a doctor, so that if they do not have a doctor or if they are being discriminated against, they can practice HRT safely and also ensure that the safest medication is available to every single person, regardless of whether that is through a doctor or otherwise. Keep in mind that we know that, that trans people will pursue HRT even when they're being discriminated against. The, we, we have scientific, solid scientific evidence, and of course, our own personal experiences to know that trans people will pursue HRT uh, even uh, when it comes at personal risk, which means that we have a duty to ensure that the medication that they are seeking out is as safe as possible, and genuinely safe as possible. And in lieu of being able to, uh, in lieu of being able to uh, uh, to access medicine easily, in lieu of universal health care, in lieu of a non-discriminatory medical system, that means that we have to make sure that DIY options, information and safe information about DIY, advice about DIY, uh, 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 resources for DIY are all as safe as possible as safe as possible. We need to have publicly accessible medical knowledge. We need to have publicly accessible dosage knowledge. We need to have publicly accessible health knowledge. We need to have publicly accessible and 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 safe HRT itself. Otherwise, people are going to die. And I've talked about this before. We can draw parallels from significantly more dangerous drugs. For example, heroin Heroin is a drug that's very, very dangerous, highly addictive, and we know that people who become addicted to heroin will use heroin even in highly dangerous situations. And through, uh, uh, through experience, observation, and simple empathy, we have realized that actually providing safe pathways uh, to heroin access and use, ensuring people aren't buying poison, ensuring people aren't injecting with dirty needles, ensuring people aren't dying in the cold while they inject, providing safe injection sites, uh, providing clean needle exchanges, providing uh, information about addiction counseling, providing free addiction help without any strings attached saves lives. It saves more lives than the a uh, fascistic alternative, which is persecution, which is restriction. We know this. Countries which have embraced harm reduction techniques for dangerous drugs have had success in saving lives because somebody who uses heroin in a safe, uh, in a safe usage uh, 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 site with a clean needle will survive to live another day in which they might finally quit and get, and beat their addiction. And that's for a dangerous and addictive drug like heroin. 
HRT is not even in the ballpark. So we should be able to easily and logically conclude that the path forward is to provide access, education, safety, cleanliness. You understand? No, uh, no uh, fear mongering, no overstating of harm. People who advocate for requiring specialist care, people who advocate for requiring psychological oversight are doing nothing short of bodily fascism. They are claiming that because you belong to a uniquely a uniquely scary class of people, that because you are trans, because you're a, a dare I say, they're calling you a degenerate, basically, because you're one of those. You need to have a psychologist tell you what a cis person can get by just talking to their doctor. I reject that. And you should reject it as well. Socked on left says, I don't think this is a one-to-one -one analogy for drug harm reduction. Portuguese drug decriminalization also included committees which can force problem users into mandatory treatment. Still a public health approach, not a carceral approach. I didn't say it was a one-to-one -one analogy. I, in fact, I explicitly said that we could draw parallels from more dangerous drugs. Obviously, heroin is a very different situation uh, and a much more dangerous drug. But yeah, I just want to be clear that I explicitly said we can draw lessons from it. It's not a one-to-one. -one. Obviously, HRT isn't addictive. I have seen a lot of rhetoric, uh, anti-DIY rhetoric, and um, and it's disgusting to me. I have seen uh, I have seen pretty shocking medical medicalist uh, uh, rhetoric recently on the rise. Uh, I think that some people's instinct uh, in the face of the uh, of the of the march of an insane fascism is to sort of try to meet a middle ground with fascist with fascistic policy. We will not win by trying to make middle ground with people who want to eradicate us. They, they are being open about it. Our opponents, op the opponents of trans people are being open about their genocidal intent. That we are not going to win by trying to play nice with them. We are not going to win by giving ground because we think that we're too afraid to make a stance. This, uh, people are linking this tweet. I strongly, strongly disagree with the argument in that tweet. Uh, uh, but I, I actually had a private conversation with Brianna Wu and it went quite well. Sorry, I need to clean my, uh, I need to clean my camera real quick. There you go. Look at that. Nice and clean. I had a private conversation with Brianna Wu and it went quite quite well, but I strongly disagree with her argument. Uh, it is not true. It is, in fact, uh, it is it is as close to objectively false as you can get. The idea that you need to have an endocrinologist. That is absurd fear-mongering. Trans people who need an endocrinologist are people who have a complicated hormonal situation. You do not. Uh, GPs all across the United States regularly prescribe HRT, um, and, uh, 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 it's just, it's just wrong. She's, she's just wrong. Brianna Wu is just wrong on this. Uh, but, but I don't have any hate for Brianna Wu. I think Brianna Wu's heart is in the right place. I just think that she's accepting framing that is incorrect and inaccurate. Uh, in my town, I mean, I live in one of the one of the trans capitals of the world there were a ton of trans people here in seattle and gps here are well educated none of them there are literally i don't even know there might even be millions of trans people or a million trans people in seattle these days there are a lot of trans people in seattle trans people have been fleeing here um and they're not dropping dead left and right they're being prescribed hrt and getting blood blood drawn by their GPs at health clinics, sometimes even by just nurses, by by registered nurses or um, what are they called? Um, the next step from a registered nurse. Um, maybe like 20K at the most, I don't know. 
I don't know the population levels. It's called a nurse practitioner, NP. Thank you, nurse practitioners. My GP is a nurse practitioner. She's amazing. She's incredibly knowledgeable on trans healthcare because the clinic that I go to is one of the primary clinics that trans people go to. She's a registered, uh, she's a, a nurse practitioner and she's able to easily make sure. I've been on hormones with her for years. My, I just had my blood done. My, my levels are fine. I'm healthy. I'm doing great. I'm a little overweight. Surprise there, wow. GP stands for general practitioner. A uh, general practitioner is a medical doctor or a family doctor or a, or a nurse practitioner who handles your everyday medical needs. They will refer you out to a specialist if there's something they can't handle. Yeah, saying all trans people need an endo is like saying all people who grow weed need to have a botanist. Yeah, I think there's probably some lines there. I would go with a different thing. Saying all trans people need a uh, a endocrinologist, it's like uh, it's like saying that you need a me a mechanic to change the oil on your car. Like a mechanic could help you, for sure, but like you can go to an to an oil change facility or you can change it yourself, and it's not that dangerous. The chances of you failing are pretty low. Obviously something could go wrong, but something can always go wrong. We can't get fear mongery about this. Somniostatic says, I've never needed anything other than a GP to get depression meds. Yup. General practitioners are, they're medical doctors or, or, or registered nurses. These people are highly qualified. It's, it's, it's fear mongering to say that every trans person needs to go to an endocrinologist. And it's also, with all due respect, classist as fuck. And endocrinologists are extremely, they're specialists who have a lot of work on, they have a lot of specialist cases. It's hard to get an appointment with an endocrinologist. It's expensive to get an appointment with an endocrinologist. You need to even get a referral often to get a, to an appointment with an endocrinologist. It's just wrong. It's not correct. And also it, it, it argues that it, it puts a limit. It means that poor trans people will die. That is what that means. If you say that trans people must have an endocrinologist, it means that poor trans people will either have to die or do pr DIY HRT, which I'm sure is probably opposed by everyone who's trying to make the claim that an endocrinologist is, is, is necessary. It's very silly and it's wrong. And it is intentionally or otherwise. I don't believe it's intentional in most cases. I think that most people are coming from a good place in their heart. Uh, but it is a form of, of bio fascism that claims that the only path, uh, to getting what you need for your body to live a life that is right for you to live freely as yourself, you must kowtow to an openly prejudiced system in many cases, in many places. Somniostatic says, Misa stepped in biofascism, stinky yucky. <laughs> yeah, we got the fucking, uh-oh, Jar Jar stepped in the biofascism. That's, that's fitting for the Star Wars arc, my god. Did we talk about Philosophy Tube? We just did. We just talked about Philosophy Tube. Uh, people who are dogpiling philosophy tube, uh, are, are, uh, suffering from what we like to call context collapse. Okay. Context collapse. You know what? This is a good opportunity for me to read you all a little article, okay? I'm gonna read you a really great article about context collapse because I think it applies here very, very well, okay? The dangers of context collapse. Let's read this real quick, okay? Context collapse is a favorite t tool of internet trolls and other disruptive influences, but it has so many other implications. 
It's important to avoid it and to recognize where context collapse is leading to incorrect belief or actions. Yeah, I'm gonna zoom up, don't worry. Ah, too much. Context collapse is itself the phenomenon of highly contextual information being used purposefully or otherwise in an ambiguous manner which leads to confusion. A pretty common example of this is the word theory. In colloquial speech, theory means the same thing as hypothesis. Uh, uh, in scientific speech. This leads to a very common chain of reasoning. The theory of evolution in the scientific sense becomes just a theory in the colloquial sense, which then is pur purposefully used to sow seeds of doubt in people using the phrase colloquially, when scientifically speaking, it's established fact. This ends up being a huge issue in a lot of unexpected places, which can often result in extremely unfortunate results, which can negatively impact people's livelihoods, even with the best of intentions. Let's see some examples. As a rhetorical device, African American. The phrase African American gained a lot of traction in the 1990s as a politically correct alternative to black, which was in turn seen as more progressive than colored. The intention was to refer to Americans who are of an African ethnic background due to the very specific historical and systemic issues which affect black Americans who came to this country by means of slavery. However, it didn't take long for this phrase to be context collapsed by people who use it to me, an American who came from Africa, including and especially white immigrants who came from South Africa, often the ones who were willing participants or in or benefactors of apartheid. There's a current trend on Twitter for people praising Elon Musk for being a successful African American. Often calling people who are opposed to him racists because of their opposition to him. It's clear and frequent co context collapse being used to attempt to silence people on a completely ridiculous basis, which some people start to actually believe as being factual. It muddies the waters and it causes endless confusion, with some people actually starting to believe that Elon Musk literally has a black ethnic identity because he's African American. Discourse and trolling. There are many social avenues on the internet where context collapse, willful or otherwise, is used to attack people based on beliefs that are unrelated or possibly in direct opposition to positions they actually hold. I can think of two silly examples in my own experience, and I have seen this happen with much more severe implications in other situations. For example, when J.J. Abrams' Star Trek reboot released, I wrote a review that was critical of it. One of my points of contention was the use of time travel as a reboot device in a way that destructively attempted to erase the original timeline where it was specifically trying to undo the amazing continuity that existed before. This led to a few people to attack me in other threads as not being a true Star Trek fan because in their minds I'd said that tri time travel doesn't belong in Star Trek and had therefore been unaware about the many time travel plots that already existed in Star Trek. See how that works? Another example in a thread about mixed drinks. I talked about how my favorite way of making a margarita was keeping it simple with tequila, agave nectar, and lime juice. The reason being that tequila is fermented from agave nectar in the first place and it pairs very well. This somehow became fluffy only drinks hard liquor mixed with sweet sweetener and was used to attack my character in bizarre ways. Other examples that I see all the time are widespread discourse and call-out posts on Twitter and Mastodon. For example, someone will post a thing about the difficulty of classifying and abolishing child pornography, in which someone then interprets them as being against the abolishment of child pornography, which then ratchets to, this person supports child pornography and pedophilia, which then leads everyone to interpreting the original thread under that lens, and then the person is branded forever as a pedophile. Do you see? You've seen that one. You all have probably seen that exact example, haven't you? In one particularly ironic example of that last one, the person was trying to away raise awareness of context collapse as an issue, and the end result was them becoming context collapsed. Unfortunately, it becomes difficult to defend people in this situation because any defense of them is then seen as def defending pedophilia, continuing a chain of context collapse. Darvo. 
In the horrifying panopticon of West Elm Caleb, which is well worth a watch, Sarah Z uses a phrase which really stuck with me. The abuser adopts the language of the abused. This comes to mind whenever I see the term Darvo being used to attack people who are simply trying to defend themselves. Darvo, you all have seen... You, do you guys remember when I have been accused of Darvoing for just defending myself? Oh my god. Darvo is short for deny, attack, reverse victim, and offender. The idea behind it is that when someone is being called out for being an abuser, the tendency is to attack the accuser and call themselves the true victim of this attack. It's a good phenomenon to be aware of, but the context collapse of the term Darvo then leads to its weaponization against people even further. To be fi to be clear, I'm not saying Darvo isn't a thing. It absolutely is. But it isn't so cut and dried, and accusations of it are often themselves a form of abuse or are used to enable it. For example, I've seen many situations where someone will be accused of being a sexual predator, and then when they deny those allegations, that leads to people to shouting Darvo because they're saying that any of the behaviors listed is a problem and that it's that not that it's all of the behaviors together. In some particular cases of this, there will be circumstantial evidence or maybe even some actual wrongdoing on part of the accused, not to the extent that they're being accused of, and any attempts at defending themselves or attempting to clarify is then labeled as Darvo and therefore more proof of their own guilt. I've seen situations where the actual issue between the two parties is resolved, but someone else decides to carry a torch on that accuser's behalf and the accused in questions questions this third party participants motives in doing so which triggers the rvo part even though the victim and offender come from a completely different context therefore it becomes another case of darvo do you see how interesting this article about context collapses do you now understand why i go through such extensive pains to ensure that when i talk about an issue i give you the context see jedi master mama truly has seen uh the ways of the internet i am able to to guide you with the ways of the force in this particular unique and strange aspect algorithmic context collapse this is a good one another troublesome situation occurs when well-meaning humans write algorithms which end up leading to a chain of events which severely and negatively impact creators and their livelihood lgbt one particular common case of this, LGBTQIA+, and its related terms are often classified as being about sexuality, when there's a broad spectrum of topics that it's about, not just sex and sexuality. There is a broad swath of systemic and social implications to members of the LGBT community, which affects people in daily life, not just in terms of sexual attraction. For example, asexuality is about a lack of sexual attraction, which in turn leads to many forms of discrimination and gender identity related topics get lumped in with sexuality when the larger implications about it are purely societal not sexual however lgbt related terms get thrown into the sex and sexuality bucket sex and sexuality often gets thrown into the pornography bucket in the mid 2000s amazon's amazon delisted all lgbt related books from search results including books intended for children because of this exact reason this was only discovered because a children's author noticed that their books weren't appearing in any search results and they had to go on a large public crusade to get the issue fixed there are ongoing issues with YouTube demonetizing, delisting, and sometimes even deleting LGBT-related content because a word gets in misinterpreted as pornographic or sexual, or is maliciously flagged as such by bad actors, conservatives, who wish to game the system. This leads to a vicious cycle where positive LGBT-related content is suppressed or marked as pornographic, which makes it harder to find and also sets up a discourse about how LGBT identities are inherently pornographic as well. This then, of course, can ratchet up into ridiculous beliefs like gay teachers are grooming their students, quote unquote, which then leads to the horror show of the current push toward don't say gay bills. Context collapse. Become educated on context collapse. By the way, angry Vicky with the $5. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much. Content moderation. 
I am a huge proponent of Bandcamp. They are by far the best place for musicians to sell their music and for fans to buy it. They have the best metadata, the most generous revenue split, especially on Friday, on Bandcamp Fridays, the most amazing post-sale support and library access, and so on. I have been on their platform since nearly the beginning, and I've also done my part to convince others to move over to it. Even with the recent and potentially troublesome acquisition by Epic Games, I still think it's the best thing around. Though, of course, I hedge my bets. Last night, I discovered that none of my music was showing up on the Bandcamp search. However, nor was it appearing in the discovery feed, which meant that the huge source of potential revenue and visibility was lost, and it made no sense what was going on. So let's talk about how bands can't artists are set up. Every, the artist has top-level tags. These are intended to just list what specific genres they work in. This is a problem for my music because you are limited to five genre tags and one broad category, and I make music in way more than five genres. Fortunately, you can also apply tags at the album and song level. These are meant to be both content-specific genres and also topic tags for what the song is about. This is very helpful for music discovery because it lets people search on their specific topics of interest, such as furry or lo-fi or coffee or the like. Anyway, since tags can be genres, it makes sense for song tags to be applied to album tags and for album tags to be applied to artists, right? Well, what happens when you write a couple of songs that are political and about the alt-right and then tag them alt-right? Well, those songs are about the alt-right, but they aren't in an alt-right genre. But the system doesn't know that they're topic tags and not genre tags, so they might as well propagate to the albums, right? And the system sees that this album is tagged alt-right, so obviously whatever alt-right means, this artist does something about it, right? So let's propagate that tag to the artist. And the result being that my entire artist account ended up being tagged as alt-right, which meant that the moderation algorithm saw that and believed me to be alt-right and delisted all of my music. It's kind of hilarious, except that this means my last several albums never got any discovery, and who knows how many sales and potential new fans I lost out on as a result. Basically, this incredibly well-meaning system ended up flagging me as being alt-right because I wrote two songs critical of the alt-right, and this greatly impacted my potential livelihood. And I had no idea any of this was happening. For at least two years, I wasn't showing up in search results or in the discovery queue because I'd been ironically labeled as something that I was protesting. Fortunately, I have a friend who works for Bandcamp who was able to escalate this issue and I've been relisted and they've since been reevaluating the system and the process involved. Unfortunately, I can't help but imagine how many other artists have been affected by this. And I doubt that any alt-right positive bands would actually be tagging themselves as alt-right anyway, as that's not a label that they use for themselves. So this was a well-meaning moderation decision put in place by a human but never properly evaluated, with far-reaching implications that have the opposite effect of the intent. This is a perfect example of the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I still love Bandcamp, and I'm glad that I was able to get this resolved for me. But resolving it just doesn't fix the problem. And of course, this goes on a little more about Bandcamp itself. In summary, whenever someone is making accusations towards the belief or character of someone else, it's worth looking into the source to make sure that there isn't context which mitigates this. No matter how many people you see favoring a particular take on things, it's possible there's a major unfortunate case of context collapse taking place. Kind of reminds you of what we were talking about with Abby here. Kind of reminds you, doesn't it? Content moderation should be done by humans, not by algorithms. Algorithmic mod moderation is helpful at some scales, but all final decisions must be reviewed by someone who has the context. And if a moderation is potentially impacting the livelihood of people being moderated, they must be aware of this and have a path towards getting it reevaluated again by a human who is aware of context. Context collapse is easy to have happen from the most innocent or well-meaning or well-intentioned of sources, and the implications can be horrifying to those who do not deserve it. The term context clap has a somewhat different meaning when used in academic circles, and I've been unable to find a suitable term for this phenomenon that's used academically. It's important to not further muddy the waters when discussing this phenomenon. There you go. And I'll give you guys the link to the original version of this, okay? Here you go. If you all want to go check this out, this is from Fluffy's website. It's an incredibly good article, and I thought it was particularly useful here. Context collapse uh, is one of the most common things on Twitter. It happens all over the place and it leads to brutal dog piles of really, really well-intentioned people. And it's one of the reasons that I take so much time going through dramas the way that I do, talking about topics the way that I do, because you deserve to hear the signal. 
You deserve to understand the context. Illusions surround us. Illusions abound, okay? There is a lot of just stupid noise all around us. So take time, find the context, and, uh, and, and analyze things based on the actual truthful context that they're in. And that includes this particular situation with Philosophy Tube, who, as it turns out, was completely correct in her argument, even if it was blown out of proportion and context collapsed into hell. Press like, subscribe, ring the bell, and don't forget to come on over to demonmama.com forward slash live for live streams, okay? I stream all the time. My content is awesome. And we want to see this channel grow. Much love.